five four three two one. I'm John Miglosh for the Wisconsin DMA and the International Society for Strategic Marketing. Is Go. that? They're putting up their yeah. cut Christmas decorations, getting the milk and cookies out for Santa, getting everything done, going to bed. They get up in the next morning, run downstairs. It's all gone. Mom! Dad! Dad! Come on! Come on, come on. Everything. Everything's gone! Everything! Everything's gone. An Outsider. It's an L.L. Bean TV commercial from 2017, which will bring us to a lot today in our show. So now let's go over to the PDFs. Okay, Tom Fishburne writes, People want brands to be purpose-led. We have to show where we stand. We're not just about profit. We have real beliefs and values. So here's our new creative brief. Let's start making ads with purpose. And then the ad agency says, guy says, okay, so what exactly is your purpose? <laughs> I was always the guy in the meetings who asked this dumb question. <laughs> it got me in a lot of trouble. Anyway, then I found out you could be a consultant and you could get paid for asking questions like this. <laughs> anyway, it says, you're the ad agency. You tell us. <laughs> what is, you tell us what our brand purpose is. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh Tom Roach had an essay just the other day saying that brand purpose was the biggest lie in the ad industry the ad industry ever had, and I think I covered that I covered that pretty well. Um, and Mondelez drew plenty of ridicule saying when they ran uh, ran a piece saying they had a new purpose led approach to marketing they called humanizing. A unique, customer-centric approach to marketing that creates human connections with purpose. Humanizing is when storytelling becomes story-doing. PR Week <laughs> prompted the question, did a robot come up with this? <laughs> Which might have been a better excuse. Just say our account got hacked. You know, something like that. So anyway, uh, there's a brand purpose bandwagon underway. Uh, Tom Roach has three categories of brand purpose. <laughs> one is born purposeful. One is like Tom's in Patagonia. No, the one that's really born purposeful, the, the forerunner of all of it is L.L. Bean. We're going to get to that story in a minute. Um, corporate converts, and then there's these ones that the marketing department dreams up the brand purpose and just does an ad campaign and may alienate three quarters of the existing customers because they don't share the passion for whatever it is that, you know, save the prairie dogs or something, who knows what, that your marketing people think is going to be fashionable. Uh, prairie dogs are great, um, they, but they're trouble for other animals who break their legs in the little holes. So, you know, just like with anything else, gotta got to be managed. Once, especially if you take out the predators, you know, save the timber wolves out on the prairie or the foxes. Anyway, whatever you're there, thanks for the thanks for the thumbs up. Okay, um, probably cooked up in the marketing department. Totally phony baloney. On balance, Tom goes on to caution: brand purpose is overused in marketing today, and its power is overstated. Right, because it's really about delivering value more than anything else. Right, and Businesses that are really worried about delivering value are and committed to conspicuous, no, con conscious capitalism. I should be conscientious capitalism. Rather than as a bolt-on marketing term, uh, are more likely to have some real purpose. And that's why we're talking about L.L. Bean. But before we go over there, I wanted to just mention the end of direct marketing, which I fe for, featured. This is a screen capture from m this morning. And... Um, yeah, 
I covered it a couple of weeks ago that target marketing was bought by Adweek. I thought perhaps it would still exist. They were just scarfing up the, the subscribers. But uh, I went on the link last week, and instead of target marketing coming up at all, um, Adweek came up with a section that's down. It's very, very well hidden in performance marketing. And that's what it's called now. So there's a subcategory of target mar of uh, ad week, and you know it's gone. And I think target marketing was the last magazine or website that had any connection to direct marketing whatsoever. If I thought ad week understood it, if I thought that measurement in e-commerce today was and and was a was an outgrowth of direct marketing i would not be so disappointed but if you do a, a google scholar search on direct marketing you'll see that i co-wrote the seminal article on the definition of direct marketing and i think almost no one ever got it uh, bob stone and i used to have coffee at his house and i said bob how could you leave out testing you put in measurable, not even measurement, but measurable. <laughs> you know, now today everything's measurable. Some people measure. Almost no one does field valid experimentation. And what I mean by that is isolating other causal variables. That's the key to direct marketing. We tested in, not we didn't just test. We tested in ways that were field valid experiments that were that were scientifically valid so we got smarter we got better observations and then we got smarter again and ll bean you know to their credit has grown more than the entire catalog industry put together pretty much over the last hundred years uh, just continues to grow when you compare them to everybody else and so there was a really great article in um, Customer Think, addressing L.L. Bean's first customer service style fi or fa fiasco, 21st century style. So L.L. Bean had their, had their 100th anniversary a little while back. And, uh, but I went over to uh, New England Historical Society where they had a wonderful article about L.L. Bean. I loved the intro right here. L.L. Bean liked to hunt and fish more than he liked to work. His first attempt at running a clothing store failed miserably because as another outdoorsman that I knew, um, Larry Huffman, who started whitetail.com. No, I own whitetail.com. He started legendarywhitetails.com, and I helped him. Uh, he said his retail store, it was like being a spider hanging in a web waiting for someone to come in the store. <laughs> He hated the retail store. And we wanted to do a catalog because a catalog he could get out and hunt, you know, <laughs> during hunting season. Didn't have to be in the store. So anyway, um, he was pushing 40 when he had the idea that would make him a household name. He came, uh, he came off a hunting trip in the Maine woods that failed because his boots got wet, leaving his feet cold and sore. A local cobbler helped him graft leather uppers to a pair of rubber work boot bottoms he then got hold of so he had rubber he had rubber bottoms so they were waterproof but leather so they were more comfortable then he got a hold of uh, uh, this is really the good part he got hold of a list of non-resident holders of maine hunting licenses so these are out-of-state people that hunted in maine and you could get a list of those people and he produced a three-page flyer with the proclamation, you cannot expect success hunting deer or moose if your feet are not properly dressed. The Maine hunting shoe is designed by a hunter who tramped the Maine woods for the last 18 years. We guarantee them to give perfect satisfaction in every way. Well, that business failed too because 90 of the first 100 pairs were returned because the leather separated from the rubber. That local cobbler, he didn't get it, okay? And you actually have to basically make the rubber around the leather and, and mold it right to it, which is how he did it in the future. 
Uh, Bean made good, though, on his 100% money-back guarantee, and he also perfected the boot, right? Here's a picture. Leon. Okay. So he was born in 1872 in uh, Greenwood, Maine, and uh, his parents died four days within four days of each other. That's something. And his locally made boots, after his locally made boots failed, he borrowed $400 in 1911 and went to Boston to persuade the United States Rubber Company to improve the quality of the shoe. The company agreed, and in another stroke of luck, the U.S. Postal Service introduced Parcel Post. Did you know that? 1911? There you go. Big, big hit. Okay. They were so popular that he, in 1917, opened his store. And in the 50s, he just said, we're not locking it. Because there was used to be a bell that you could ring. And he might come to the door any time, day or night. At 3 in the morning, people would, you know, I got to go hunting tomorrow and I need something. Okay. So anyway, uh, here's, have your old hunting shoes rebuilt, 285. There you go. Shake his hand anytime you, <laughs> John Gould said, in an article, if you drop in to shake his hand, you'll get home to find his catalog in your mailbox. I love that. What a what a what a legendary what a legendary expression right there. So he did the follow up. He got your name and he made sure you had a you, a catalog. He hit one million in sales in 1937. Okay, in 1951 he opened the date. He opened the store full time. Uh, he's a legend and he continues. His legacy continues to this day, which I really liked. Now, this author over here, Paul Selby, said, you know, if this happened to you, hopefully you don't just have one product and you don't just sell a hundred of them. But he talks about how L.L. Bean did it and how now you could have all this whiz-bang technology to fix all this stuff so everybody would be notified. We'd quit selling them instantly online. We would get R&D to fix it. We would proactively identify all the customers and notify them. Yeah, well, you know what? I haven't seen that happen ever in my life. So, Paul, much as I like your, uh, <laughs> much as I like your article and where it comes from, um, uh, you know, I think you have to have the spirit of a, of a failed businessman running the business who cares more about his own integrity and his own name and his own guarantee of the product than he cares about the whiz-bang tech. And you don't see companies like this every day. L.L.B. not only recovered from that first product failure, but went on to become a legendary brand in outdoor products and customer service. Those successes were no doubt built on Additional lessons from errors in design and manufacturing. L.L. Bean has persevered with customer service that stands behind the company's products. And that, my friends, is the rest of the story. It's integrity. Wasn't making perfect products. Wasn't perfect marketing. It was integrity that built that brand. And there are some pro there are some companies that have that today. I, I can't speak for L for Land's End right now, but back in the 90s, I was doing some consulting for them. We built a catalog game together, and I was, they, they invited me to look through the, the library. They had a direct marketing library, so I went back there, and it turned out to be locked. Maybe appropriate <laughs> these days, a, a foreshadowing of the future, and uh, the, because I don't know where the archives went now from I'll have to look up some of my articles on target marketing from the 90s. Uh, fortunately, we have an archive on WDMA to some extent, some PDFs of some great legendary uh, material in the members only uh, section. Don Libby's book on, L on uh, RFM, for example, is in there in its entirety. So anyway, I was back there waiting for somebody to come and unlock the library and across the hall was a, a meeting going on. LL, or, uh, Land's End was getting into the uh, home product market and they were they were they were talking to a vendor who made bath towels and I happened to overhear it and they and the L or the Land's End people said we don't want to tell you how to make bath towels but we want to tell you that we do stand behind our products 100 percent 
So we don't want you to make a bath towel that will come back right away. We want you to make a bath towel that if it ever does wear out, people are so happy of about how much use they got out of it and how nice it was and how it felt that rather than send it back, they want to buy another one. That's the way we run our business. And it was so refreshing to hear, you know, one of the downstream purchasing agents not say we want the lowest price you know lowest 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 that's all we care about it was really nice to hear behind the scenes I don't know who it was I didn't go in the room I didn't you know I shouldn't have been there they didn't do it for me I can tell you that but it was so refreshing to hear from the back room of a company the speech they gave to the vendors about product quality not the speech that they gave to each other and that's real brand building. That's integrity. Have a great day. Happy Thanksgiving. Like and share. Your friends will know you're smart. Bye-bye.